Hi, and welcome to Stressed, the podcast to develop your stress resilience. Being ambitious and successful while living a happy life is possible. Learn how you can better cope with stress in day-to-day -day situations by applying tools and techniques that work for you. My name is Julia Arndt, and I'm extremely grateful that you decided to check out my podcast today. Let's get started. I am super excited to have a wonderful podcast interview guest this week, and her name is Johanna. Hi, Johanna. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Julia. I'm am, really thrilled to be here. I'm really thrilled that you're here. <laughs> I was just saying we have to push the topic um, further forward in the podcast episode series because your topic is so interesting and I really, really want to share it with as many people as possible. Well, thank um, but you. before we're jumping into all of these things, um, let's pick up our listeners a little bit. So where are you located and what time is it and what have you been up to this morning? Sure. So I'm located here in, in New York City, in Manhattan. I live in Brooklyn and I work at a, a nonprofit economic think tank uh, in Manhattan. Uh, what I did today, I woke up, it was quite cold. So I packed, I put on a scarf and I, bun and I rushed my way to the subway and now I'm here. I'm just trying to chug along and I'm really excited. Thank you again so much for having me to speak about this topic. I'm yeah. I'm really excited. And um, one question that I have to ask you now that you said that you've been kind of, you know, rushing into the subway and you live in New York City and you work for a company and it looks obviously very corporate where you're sitting as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you do to take care of your own mental health um, on a day to day basis? Yeah, that's a really great question. Good timing, too. I, uh, meet, I have a psychiatrist that I've been meeting with over the past decade or so. I met with her yesterday. I have a really great support system, uh, family and friends, and I have a very open, uh, like honest environment where people, it's a very give and take where I listen to them, they listen to me, and it's, just, it's a really good support system uh, mm -hmm. in, in the, uh, my workplace as well as outside, and I think that's a really important dynamic to have, that balance. Um, in New York, everyone, it's, it's kind of like a joke that everyone you meet as some sort of anxiety or depression or there's just something because there's so many things happening in New York so mm -hmm. I'm really lucky that it's the environment that I grew up in and that I'm surrounded by that it's not really a taboo conversation um I you know I, I tell my boss I'm going to my psychiatrist I my she's like part of the family so nice. I'm really lucky that I'm able to have that support system and to be honest and open about it and not be and not be ashamed <laughs> yeah that's awesome that's really yeah. great Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, so tell us a little bit more about yourself. Maybe introduce yourself and tell us what you've been up to over the last five years. Sure. So my name is Johanna Seitenbach. I, as I mentioned, I live here in New York City. And I, in addition to working at the conference board, I just completed my master's in corporate communications at Baruch College. And, and um, in completing that course, Uh, that uh, program, I completed my thesis, which took me about two years. Um, and the thesis is an exploratory study of how millennials approach and communicate mental health in the workplace. So there's two, uh, it, there's two focuses on how they approach it currently and how companies are currently, what they're actually doing. And then the second part is what millennials want them to be doing or what they find to be most important, what they think of when they think of mental health. And, I, and it was really important to compare and contrast because um, as I'll go into later, some companies are investing in the wrong resources or not putting their money where uh, it would be mo the most useful for millennials and for um, them to improve their mental health or the, their well-being. So that was really my focus. And after completing that and defending the thesis, I now have my master's, which I'm so thrilled to say. Congratulations. And That's very thank exciting. You. <laughs> thank you so much. I Thank you. And in my day job, what I do at, at this research think tank, uh, we produce a lot of research and data in, in labor markets, uh, consumer dynamics, corporate communications, human capital. And my job is to connect different executives around the world with our research and our data and our experts to kind of keep them up to date. So with that is kind of how I fell in love with corporate communications. And I found a passion and I went with it in my master's at Baruch. And by starting that, I found this niche of mental corporate mental health communications and i just really wanted to dive deep in that 
and find out how millennials are approaching it because you always hear you know millennials are the most open generation they're they want the craziest things they're very <laughs> taboo um so i i wanted to kind of get to the bottom of that and see if it's really true uh what they say millennials are like i am a millennial myself so it was really mm -hmm. interesting to see the data and to be able to capture that on a in a concrete manner yeah that's so awesome. And um, I saw actually uh, that you posted about your master thesis on LinkedIn and I was like, wow, what a cool subject, millennials and mental health in the workplace. Yeah, um, yeah. So I was really excited to get in touch with you. I read um, your thesis as well. So I'm super excited to talk a little bit about your findings. Yeah, um, so the yeah. first question that I have for you is, um, what are, well, give us a little bit maybe an introduction into uh, why did you choose the subject and what was your approach and how many people did you survey for your study? Sure. So I chose this topic because I, as I mentioned, uh, like many millennials that I studied and have interviewed, have gone through my own personal mental health journey. And I was fortunate to grow up in an environment that was very open and honest, but mm -hmm. I still had hiccups in the road. And a lot of people I've talked to have as well. And I think that intersection between the workplace and the home life has been blurred a lot and it's a lot of people are bringing their whole self to work and they're they're good the bad the ugly and so I was really fascinated by what that means for an employer and what they can get out of it why would an employer invest in these resources sure it's the right thing to do sure you want to have a healthy environment you want your employees to be happy but there's more to it there's an actual tangible investment and I wanted to get to the bottom of that and see is it really as important as it, as I think it is for the yeah. majority of millennials yeah. and now millennials are the biggest uh, working generation so it it's moving to that direction so they're going to be they're being leaders and executives now and if we if companies are not in tune with what they want there's a lot of disconnect and you know there, that's a lot of job changing and not hiring the best talent so it's really about Keep, keeping it customized and keeping it up to date with what the workforce wants and what the workforce really needs. Because mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer in mental health, mental health isn't an option, it's a necessity. And every yeah. as, as companies have health insurance, um, mental health, it just needs to be incorporated into that as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. And um, so how many people did you survey? I surveyed 254. And it was a 20 question survey that I did through uh, uh, Qualtrics, it's a software. And for this study, um, I defined a millennial as anyone from the ages of 22 to 38. So um, everyone kind of has a little bit of a different range, but that's the range that the Pew uh, Research uh, study that they targeted. So that's the one that I used for my research. And we had 254, they were all over the US um, and with all different kinds of jobs. I didn't focus, in, indirectly on a, the type of job um it was just kind of a general because there hadn't been that much research done specifically on millennials i just wanted to kind of do an overall what millennials are feeling what they're experiencing what what are the next steps so um but there is definitely opportunity to go deeper into blue collar versus white collar um also the lgbtq like how they approach mm -hmm. mental health and mm -hmm. also um full-time versus part-time there's just so many different iterations of course so many things that you can that. cut and slice yeah yeah exactly so i wanted to just really take the the overall overarching approach and kind of see what um what some what um similarities and what um findings i can get from that and then hopefully maybe down the line uh continue the research or help uh, help somebody else continue the research on this topic mm -hmm. so you said um, you defined millennials from the age of 22 to 38 Yes. Wow, correct. that's really interesting. That's that is mm -hmm. kind of a wide range. Um, that yeah. I I would have expected like maybe twenty two to twenty eight or something like that. No, well, yeah, I know, right? People always think it's um it's uh, very young, but it is to thirty eight. That's um how a lot of people define it. And within that, it'd be really interesting to see the the lower, medium, and the higher range of how mm -hmm. they approach it. If there are even differentiations between the different um, chunks within the millennial span, because I'm sure there are, because mm -hmm. some millennials grew up with all technology and some millennials exactly. kind of had to find technology like the, uh, as they were, as they aged. So it's really interesting. And I think that's another uh, way you, you, I could take this research to dive mm -hmm. into the different sections, but yeah, 22 to 38 mm -hmm. is the, uh, yeah. 
That's really interesting because I'm 33 <laughs> oh, yeah. and I don't really consider myself a millennial because I didn't really grow up with mobile phones. I had a phone definitely, I think when I was like 14 or 15, I had my first phone, but it was obviously not a smartphone, just, just yeah. a, a small Nokia. It was red. I remember that. <laughs> um, but yeah. my first, I actually got my first um, you know, like smartphone when I started my job. Oh. So when I was 25. Yeah. yeah. So before that, I didn't really have internet or like all these different things. Yeah. That what would be about... really interesting to compare that to someone who's 22 who's kind of grown up. Exactly. In... You are 26, right? I'm 25. Yeah. You're 25. Close. So <laughs> how, yeah, close. How, um, how did you grow up? Did you have a smartphone? Do you remember that a little bit? Like, yeah, I didn't grow up with a <laughs> smartphone, but I did grow up with a cell. I think I got my first cell phone in fifth grade and okay. I remember sh I had to share it with my dad so whenever he needed it, he got the cell phone and whenever I needed it, I got it. <laughs> Luckily, he only needed it like once or twice a month. But I remember specifically every morning I'd have to ask him, dad, do you need the phone? And then we would just share one phone. It was really silly now thinking about it because we just can't get away from our phones. And I have a smartphone now, but it was a flip phone. It, you know, it didn't uh -huh. do much, but I, I liked it. It did the trick. Yeah. <laughs> and then do you remember when you had your first smartphone? Good question probably in 11th grade maybe in like high school yeah okay are blackberries considered smart phones i had a blackberry i don't, I don't really know because i had a blackberry as well before i started um like when i was 25 when i started my first um real job um, yeah. i had a blackberry before but i i'm trying to remember yeah, <laughs> if the right? blackberry i mean i feel like there were there was email functionality on my blackberry yeah. but Still not as you would define, I think, a smartphone today where you have right. like different apps and, you know, you have sure. Facebook and Instagram. Like, I don't really think I had that on my BlackBerry. Yeah. <laughs> Too long ago. Yeah, anyway, right. um, so that's really interesting. Okay, so you did a study with around 250 people. And what were your biggest findings? Sure. So my biggest findings were that, and it comes to no shock, this was in line with my hypothesis, that millennials want their employer to both walk the walk and be willing to talk the talk. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that millennials want, millennials believe it's important, it's very important that a company is cognizant and aware of their employees' mental health. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of have a pulse on what's going on. They're not, they kind of can, can steer the conversation. They take surveys or they have uh, conversations, and so they're aware of what's going on. There was actually 64% of millennials believe it's extremely important for companies to be cognizant of their employees' mental health. And then the next question I asked on a scale of one to five, how important do you think it is for a company to have the proper resources and support in place to combat, uh, the, to uh, work with employees' mental health? And 57% marked said five it's, mm. it's the most important it's absolutely it's five and so that means millennials are expecting their employer to know what's going on and also be at, proactive about it and really put um put initiatives in place to to both um tackle to address the issues that are happening and to prevent them from happening and it's it has to be authentic and it has to be um it has to be in line with the company's strategy mm -hmm. So that was one of the biggest findings. Um, another one is that mental health days and a flexible work environments are most wanted by millennials. Yeah, that's, most, that, I found that super interesting when I read that. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Sure. So they're most wanted and they're actually the, what they get, they're receiving the most. So millennials are actually expecting work, uh, their work culture to have this open, free, flat, like they can go take a do do a doctor's appointment or take the kids to daycare. They're expecting it and they value it the most. So it's something that companies really need to put at the forefront of their mental health strategy because it's it they they can find it elsewhere. They it's it's not no, it's no longer a competitive advantage. It's something that's really expected and really valued. So if it's not there, a mo like millennial workforce will notice and it will take away from their uh, work experience and their productivity. Mm -hmm. I was shocked to know that 22% of companies still don't have anything uh, in place around mental health, mm -hmm. according to the respondents. So that's a big chunk. That's almost one fourth that mm -hmm. don't, aren't doing anything. It's mm -hmm. not a mental health day, not a flyer, not uh, bringing someone in from the outside, which is, is, it's still, it's definitely a lower number than it used to be, but it's still um, there and it's still uh, quantifiable. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it just goes to show that 
companies really are, are they're making, they're moving in the right direction, but there's still work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and so 60% of millennials associate a positive mental health culture with one that incorporates a flexible work environment. So they are expect, like I mentioned before, they're expecting it and they associate it uh, with the two. And it's interesting because sometimes you think of a flexible work environment, you kind of just think, oh, you know, you, you can come in when you want, you can leave when you want, You're, it's, it's like that environment of trust. People don't always associate with mental health. And I think that's just a really interesting um, note to, to, to point out that mental health doesn't always look like mental health. It's not having therapists 24 seven. It's not, um, uh, it's not like paying for therapy or, or um, HR benefits. It's really, it's, it comes in. It starts with the really things. small things. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It could be as simple as a manager, go, their manager goes through training and isn't afraid to mention that they're struggling with their mental health or that an associate is, is, is aware of what the stressors that they, that can trigger their, um, a poor mental health day. It, it can just be a, having that, those conversations. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a whole overarching, um, like transformation. It can start with the little things that'll then infiltrate in the culture. And I think that's really important because in the beginning of the survey, I defined what mental health is just to give a baseline because everyone kind of approaches and defines mental health differently. Because um, a lot of people, when they hear about my survey, they think, oh, I only interview, I only survey people with depression or anxiety or PTSD mm -hmm. or addiction. But no, I interviewed, I, I surveyed everybody. There's no limit. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. There's so much more to mental health. And everyone has, everyone experiences some sort of mental health um, issues or disruptions or po even positive um, co contributions to their mental health. So it's really important to talk about it in a holistic manner before kind of diving deep into the, the different or like the issues. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, I think that's really powerful that you say that because there's like this one quote that, that I like to quote often that is um, not everyone has a mental illness, but everyone has mental health because exactly. we all have physical and mental health. Right. And if sure. we don't, that then we could potentially get sick either physically or mentally, but we all have mental health just as we have physical health. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand or haven't thought about it like that. And then yeah. the other thing that, that I think is really interesting, and I've been doing that research for my book, was um, what is mental health? What is actually the definition of mental yeah. health? And it just says that it is a person's psychological and emotional well-being. And we all yeah. have that, right? We that's are exactly, all caring about the, that. That's the exact definition I used for my survey. Oh, so nice. That's great. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that tied in yeah. nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I didn't want people to go in being like, oh, I don't have to take this. I don't have depression. I don't see a th therapist, but it's, exactly. yeah, as I mentioned, it's, it touches everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's a really good point. And I think knowing that the corporate mental health strategy can look, can be so many different things. It, it's, yeah. it, and one of my recommendations is it's not a one size fits all model. Mm -hmm. It's re really, you can take bits and pieces. Well, you know, some companies do it really great. American express has a really great culture. Uh, mm -hmm. It, uh, Ernst and Young does too. So, like, use these case studies. Definitely, don't need, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. But it's really seeing what works and what would work for your own culture, and and not to copy, but to kind of to test out and to see, take bits and pieces from here and what's working, and kind of develop your own culture. And um, and then that's going to be the most authentic, and that's going to mitigate the most stigma. And so, the most more people are going to be able to use it um, mm -hmm. in turn. So, I think that that's a really good approach. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's really good. And I think you mentioned one important thing as well, like culture. I think culture is something that is hard to build. Yeah. It's something that you don't build in like six months. And so really thinking about that and being very strategic, I think about how you want to build your culture is equally as important. Yeah, absolutely. It has to start from the top down. It's mental mm -hmm. health is still seen as so taboo. And so mm -hmm. um, people are very uncomfortable talking about it. Um, and I find that if it starts from the top down, if, if you really get an executive sponsor or somebody to really spearhead the, the, the culture change, it, it does wonders and it really, um, makes it more authentic and, and it really kind of puts your money where, where the company's money, where their mouth is. Like, so they walk the walk and talk the talk. They're able to do mm -hmm. both. So I think that's very important. I would agree. Yeah. Great. What else? What else did you find? Yeah, sure. Um, so along the lines of uh, mental health days, 
81 or 82 percent of respondents that are satisfied with the way their company approaches mental health are currently work at a company that has mental health days so that just uh is another iteration of the happiest the most satisfied employees they experience uh the flexible work environment mental health days and it goes so much more beyond just a doctor's appointment it's really that trust being able to have that trust with your director and your manager to so they know you're going to get the work done and you don't have to stay till seven to do it. If you want to go home and bring your laptop, done, laptop home and get it done, as long as it's done in a timely manner, um, it, can, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. You have to sit in your desk and, and stare at the computer. It's, it can be very flexible. And it, like I said, it just goes beyond calling it a mental health day. People are uncomfortable with that. Um, we call it floating holidays here, or floating days, and mm -hmm. you can just take them when you want. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, it's, it, it doesn't need to be called mental health if that makes people uncomfortable still. So I think that's really, you know, something to also know. Um, I think that's a really important point um, that yeah. we don't have to call it mental health. And even when you're talking about those flexible days, I'm even thinking, you know, like one person is more productive in the morning and the next person yeah. is more productive in the afternoon. And the other, and one person might need an afternoon nap and the other person likes to go to the gym at 11 o'clock in the morning you know like there's all these different things and one of the things that I've been doing research on and that I found really interesting is I've been talking a lot with consulting companies as well of how they um, you know how they promote mental health and how they work together because it's obviously very high pressure um, yeah. environments and McKinsey for example in the US they when they start a project they usually sit together as a project team and they go one by one and talk about this is what I need in order to stay sane. So the first person might say, I need to go to the gym at 11 o'clock or I have, a, I have a child and I need to go home at four o'clock in order to pick them up um, and then I will be connected again from X to Z, you know. But yeah. I thought that was really powerful yeah. that they did that. It's, it's something so simple, right? But mm -hmm. just doing that and actually sitting down and acknowledging every single person and acknowledging what they need in order to thrive in the workplace, I thought yeah. was really incredible. Yeah. Wow. I'm really happy to hear that. I think that is really powerful. And it, it goes to show, again, it's not just the people who have depre or some depression or anxiety or some sort of uh, label. It's everybody has these, these yes. triggers, these stressors, you know, mm -hmm. the, somebody has to pick their child up from daycare, or ha like really needs to go to the gym at 11. It's, it's not a weakness. In fact, I think it's a strength to be able to say, this is what yeah. I need to work, to work to my full potential. And it's the people who don't really talk about it that I, that, or are afraid to talk about it, that kind of bottle it up and then it, it, it builds over time. Mm -hmm. It definitely does. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. That's really yeah. interesting about McKinsey. Um, mm -hmm. We partner with them quite a bit at the conference board. So it's good to know. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, one of my other findings is that there's a greater opportunity for com companies to partner with outside organizations or nonprofits that promote healthy mental well, well-being practices. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, millennials are smart. They know that their <laughs> companies, that their employers um, that they work at for aren't experts. You know, they work in banks and uh, law firms and doctor's offices. They're not experts in mental health, but they should be willing to partner with that, the experts to bring in the third party. And it really, go, it really helps to bridge that gap because a lot of people are more comfortable talking to a third party uh, source or learning even the even uh, trainings and, and outside um, resources to just get that bring that into the workplace so it's not just in this like this bubble um, of like of everybody internal talking it really I get that outside environment um, only 11% of companies are currently bringing in outside uh, mm -hmm. organizations whereas 26% of Millennials chose that as one of their most valued resources so there is a, about a uh, 15% uh, gap. So that's something that companies, if they really want to stand out, if they want to have a really strong mental health culture, they should partner, uh, be thinking about partnering with nonprofits that do this for a living. It's their mission. It's their, what they, uh, what the, keeps their lights on. It's what like they, um, their purpose of, of really fostering that healthy work environment and being able to have those tough conversations that maybe an employer isn't equipped to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and um, I remember from you re reading the thesis as well, I think, you know, obviously you are in communication. So there was some focus as well on how um, employees or like millennials, what kind of their preferences are in terms of communication mediums about mental health. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Sure. So yes, um, I did focus on the communication aspect because you can. Um, it's really important because you can invest so much money, so many resources for the top initiatives. But if the employees don't know about it, it, it only goes so far. Mm -hmm. So the best way to to reach employees is to have a diversified communication approach. Uh, millennials, I asked them the top three communication approaches that they would find most effective in communicating mental health resources. And a lot of them, there was a mix of in-person and virtual. Email was the number one overall, which makes sense. It's easy. Um, it doesn't, it's not very time consuming. It can happen uh, many times. It can be repetitive. But then the second was teams, like in team mm -hmm. meetings. So having that in person, it really helps. I had a manager once that, say, that said, you don't really process information unless you've heard it six times. Yeah. So if you if it's six emails, it's not going to be as effective as two emails and two in-person meetings and one uh, company-wide meeting. Yeah. Um, it, it just kind of diversifying the approaches because then it'll stick. It'll be like, oh, I did get that email about that. Thanks for bringing it up when you have your uh, managers meet, your meeting with your manager. So it's really about di diversifying the approach so that uh, millennials really can can grasp what um, is at hand. Because a lot of I did interviews to prep for my survey. A lot of people had to think like, what are our mental health resources? Like I never even thought about it. And it's yeah. whether they need it or not, they should know it's there because if they do need it, they shouldn't have to go scrambling. They shouldn't think that they, there's nothing available, that they're alone. It's, it's just being able to have them that there is like the fundamental, um, baseline that I find really important. Yeah. I think that's, you know, we talked a little bit about that the first time we talked and that is one thing for me that is so, so important, like that preventive aspect of right. like, you know, is it enough for a company to offer mental health programs when you are in need or should they be even more preventative? So how do I bring in, um, you, you know, methods and skills to prevent people to even get there because we right. all have mental health. We all exactly. know that we need to work out and we need to eat healthy in order to protect our physical health, but we haven't really learned what we need to do in order to take care of our mental health. Right. And that is for me something, you know, that I'm thinking a lot about and where yeah. I'm like, I think that that is even the next step. So having mental health programs is good But if you want to, you know, hire and retain the best talent, you also need to have preventative programs. And it doesn't, and you said that before, and I love that you said that, we, it doesn't have to be called mental health. It right. could be how to develop peak performance habits, for example, or how to stay the high achiever, right? Because we all identify with these words. We all want to be that, right? Um, so, so how do we bring that into the workplace? to protect our people because when you don't have mental health then it will all of the other areas in your life will suffer as well right because we make all of the decisions with our brains right. <laughs> so no, if you're absolutely. if you're not up to uh, you know if you're not really f like fully there or i don't know how to say it but you know if if your mental health is is kind of um challenged then you know you don't choose anymore to go to the gym and take care of yourself because your mental health is not there. So, um, so yeah, I think mental health is really the first thing that we should think about before even going down the route of physical health as yeah, well. Yeah, I completely agree. And a lot of companies that I've, I've studied, they are, kind of, they are um, putting the two together, which I think is really great. Awesome. And they're talking about one with the other, one alongside the other and how that, that, uh, that relationship exists. Mm -hmm. Um, I also want to mention that um, in the, uh, what you said before about how um, the, the mental health strategy needs to um, just be a resource for everyone. And, and I think it's really important to think of not only the associates, but anyone from the intern to like the people yeah. who, yeah, to the people who are, have been working there for 40 plus years, the person who started yesterday. And, how they need to, they might need to be communicated in a different manner. It's not all the same, but millennials do find that email is, is really useful and trainings and, and to be able to just diversify those communication approaches and to get um, it. Because again, it's, if they're not aware, if they're not um, up to date with what is going on, they're not going to use it. And I think also that being, uh, having the communications background, there's so much, as you mentioned, retention and, um, 
and hiring um, jo like new job talent. It's such a way that companies can differentiate themselves. And if and 70, uh, 74% of millennials are more likely to apply for a job knowing that the company has a strong mental health culture, which yeah. is that I love that you had that number as well. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah, that's know. just that's huge. talent. That's money. That's yeah. progress. That's everything. Yeah. Um, and I think that's huge. And then that's so that's on the internal uh, side. And I also asked from an external standpoint, sales. Would you be more likely to buy a product or service if you knew the company had a strong mm -hmm. mental health culture? And three out of every four millennials said that they are more likely to purchase a product or service knowing the company has a strong mental health culture, which I think is it, that's incredible because it, you can, it's not only an internal um, strategy, but it's also external. It can increase sales. It can boost, um, it can increase the reputation and, mm -hmm. and uh, increase anything like stock prices. So I think it's, it, it no longer is an, only an internal strategy. It needs to be on the external. It can be in the media. I know I, Chipotle recently came out and that they're uh, paying for a lot of their employees uh, mental health uh, services like therapists and psychiatrists and that came out in the news and that's great promotion and PR for them yeah. but they're also helping them internally so I think that balance is it's not only an internal conversation anymore it's really external and and it can really boost sales and increase the reputation and help the stocks and I just I think I'm a big proponent in being able to utilize it to its full potential and being able to really see the return on the value and the investment of these mental health resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really awesome. Were there any other findings that you wanted to mention or should we move on to mm -hmm. what surprised you most? Because I think there are some really cool things in there as well. Yeah, we can move on to what surprised me most. Okay. But that also kind of goes <laughs> into my findings. Yeah. Okay, tell us about that. So um, my hypothesis, the one that I did not get correct, um, which happens, is that millennials would not take a pay cut to uh, mm -hmm. implement their uh, top three mental health initiatives. And I was wrong. Um, quite a few actually would. 43% uh, of millennials would choose to take a pay cut to implement their top three mental health initiatives. And the reason I thought they wouldn't is because uh, in my research, um, I found that a lot of them are, are still have college debt, um, are getting married later, not having that as much security. So they want or are un um, unhappy with their current salary. So a lot of them wouldn't really take that pay cut. They kind of want to hold on to their money. But the uh, results did show that they would. They would. Their top three uh, mental health initiatives and those uh, and the, those top three initiatives um, for um, that people would choose to take a pay cut for were mental health days in a flexible work environment, which is at sixty seven percent. HR benefits plan with mental health specific resources, which is at 55%, and manager trust and empathy trainings at 40%. Mm -hmm. So again, these are three resources that employ employees are willing to take a pay cut for, which I think is uh, really interesting. And it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 I think sure. that uh, that was one that surprised me. And then, um, the, as I mentioned before, the internal and external, how much it would affect internal and external environment in a corporation. So the more millennials would apply for a job, but my prediction, my hypothesis was that it wouldn't really affect the sales. Uh, people wouldn't be more likely to buy a product because they're just kind of looking for the cheapest. But in yeah. fact, three out of every four millennials do say that it, it matters and they do care that a, a, a employer does have that, does promote mental health practices, does have that open, uh, like uh, stress-free uh, environment. So I think that's really telling. And that's something that surprised me that I always like like to share when people are a little hesitant about mental health in the workplace. I'm like, they're, the benefits are there. You, they're, you, they're really concrete. Yeah. So. Here's like black on white, the numbers of why exactly. you should invest in it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But it's so fascinating. Um, I really, I think it's so interesting, all of the findings that you had. And was there anything else from... Uh, just... Those are, yeah, no, that was it for what surprised me most. Cool. Yeah. And obviously, and you know, we talked about this before as well, if people want to read your thesis and they want to yeah. read the whole study, of course, um, they can get the the link. Um, it's going to be in the show notes. I'll put it there and you actually have it public so you they can download it and read it. Um, yeah. It's, a, I think, 50 or 60 page report. So yeah. super yeah. interesting, super worth the time. Time. And one of the questions that I asked you as well when we talked for the very first time was, um, why do you think millennials think more about mental health programs and make it a priority for their job choice? Because you are a millennial, like for me, you are more a millennial than I perceive myself as a millennial, even though I think it's interesting 
you know, mm -hmm. that you said it's 22 to 38 and there's obviously, you know, maybe differences in those brackets as well. But, um, you know, I've never really thought about mental health until it, you know, kind of affected me um, in my early 30s. And I think it's so fascinating that more and more people are aware of, of the mental health. Yeah. And removing also with that, hopefully, the stigma that mental health still has. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so why I think millennials and from the research, the literature review that I did is that a lot of them have grown up in a more open environment. Um, I know from my experience, my parents worked in a very corporate world and that wasn't discussed very often, but the, the culture and the environment that they fostered at home, it was more open. It was accepting into like what we wanted to talk about and our mental health. So that's uh, one aspect. And as I mentioned in the beginning, there's a limited work-life separation now as much as there was back in the day so now because we're expected to bring our whole self to work we bring the good the bad the ugly the scared the stressed the you know everything and it's mm -hmm. because of that because we're being we're being contacted at crazy hours or you know the, you, you can com be commuted you can get emails at three in the morning and content and you know phone calls at seven at night and it's just because we're always kind of feel like we have to be on it's harder to separate the two mm -hmm. um and the two are the two worlds are meshing more so now than they ever were because of globalization different time zones um i know when we partner with people in other countries it's like we have to stay on later they have to stay on late and it's really about balancing that and 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 because of that you bring your whole self to work and i think that's really why mental health now so more than ever is really just such a topic in and in the forefront um and the last is the uh, extreme technological changes and turnover um, there's this great um, study and it's like the art of perfectionism and when are we ever going to be perfect and millennials, you know, every generation kind of wants to be more perfect than the other and it's very um, telling and then it's just because there's a lot of outsourcing of jobs and, and the whole idea that AI and robots can replace humans. It's just like that idea of perfectionism is really uh, on the shoulders of a lot of millennials and they, they feel that pressure and because of that, you know, they have to like per perfectionism comes at a cost and it's really hard to be efficient and on all the time and also get your work done and also take care of your mental health so it's balancing all of those things um yeah so that those are like the main reasons that i think it's such a a, a strong there's such a strong hold on uh overlap between mental health and millennials and that's why i focused my thesis on it i'd i'd be so interested to see the next generation generation z and how they approach mental health i think you know, they'll be even more, my guess is they'll be even more open than we are. And I, I don't know, like, I, I think it's just going to be, it's going to go, it's going to be different than it was. And I'm excited to see it and research it and experience it myself. So. Yeah, exactly. I, I wonder if, you know, I, I always wonder, are people also maybe more affected? Like, you know, like younger millennials, I'm thinking more like the tw maybe 22 to 26 bracket, um, because they've been so exposed to being on their phones and being exposed to social media and the likes and the comments and the pictures and all these different things has that had already an earlier effect on their mental health as well. And hence, they are now more aware that that's something that they need to take care of. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely think that mm -hmm. it has that, yeah, would uh, play a factor. And also just like reading up and learning and different with the news and like learning about like information moves so fast. So and everyone has a access to different news articles and 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 millennials and younger people are able to access so much more than ever before and because of that they're kind of growing up a little bit faster learning a little bit more and they're kind of knowing what's out there and i think that also can as you mentioned uh, really impact our mental health yeah i was i think i i talked about this before in, a, in an interview but um, i was reading recently um, a magazine i don't know if it was health or yoga journal or something like that and they had a couple of profiles of of teens they were like 12 years old 13 years old 14 years old and they were talking about mental health and it was it blew my mind you know because i was like wow like they're already thinking about these things and they're thinking about you know being more present and being more mindful and being disconnected and i was like you know, it, it shocked me a little bit on the one hand, because I'm like, I, I don't know if teens really have to think about these things that early. And it kind of, you know, makes them grow up so much faster and have less of a childhood. Um, but then at the same time, you know, because they are so connected and we are growing up with screens nowadays and 
um, maybe it's maybe it's important and it's crucial that we talk that they talk about it already. You know. Right. Yeah. 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 No, I think it's. Uh, I'm interested to see it develop, yeah. and that's yeah. you know another direction the research could go, and seeing how Gen Z approaches it too. Yeah, and it's the culture as well, right? They just grow up with the culture now that mental health and physical health is equally as important. Right. Yeah. Definitely. And we grow up with, oh, physical health is important, but mental, like nobody ever talked to me about that. <laughs> right, right. No, totally. But yeah. Okay. Awesome. So I always have a few questions at the end of each podcast. Um, so I sure. want to move into those. And the first question is, what are you most grateful for? Well, I um, might be a little cheesy, but I am most grateful for my mom and my relationship with my mom. We're very, very close. I talked to her this morning. Uh -huh. She's the, my strength and like she is such a big proponent of me being open about my mental health and i this thesis would not be here without her support and i yes i am definitely most grateful for my mother and the relationship nice. we have there that's wonderful yeah. um and do you have three important wisdoms that you would like to share with the rest of the world yeah sure so one my sister-in-law told me when i was starting grad school and i was a little i was struggling with working full-time and part-time and uh, working full time and doing part time grad school, and she said education is is truly money in the bank. You can never learn too much. Mm -hmm. I think that's just so important. Um, everyone's just no one knows everything, so it's so important to learn and be open um, and to make these connections like we did to, today. And yeah. uh, everyone has something to learn, and it's just about being proactive about it. So I think that's the first. Um, the second is from my one of my favorite books, The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, it's that don't let the bastards grind you down. It sounds a lot better when they say it in Latin. <laughs> no te te bastardis caborandorum. So if you watch it, if any Handmaid's Tale fans out there, um, they know it's just a, a good quote I like to live by. And then my last is uh, your differences are your greatest strengths, which is something that I, I remind myself and I think a lot of people should, um, that if something makes you different, it's not, we it's not bad. It's honestly mm. everyone in the culture of, everyone kind of being the same. It's so good to stand out and your differences are your greatest strength. I'm a firm believer of that. Hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And do you have any books maybe besides the book that you just mentioned that have really shaped you as a person or that maybe you're reading over and over and over again, because every time you read them, there's like another nugget that you find. Yeah. So I've been, I read this past year, Know My Name by Chanel Miller. It's um, a memoir. It's, um, it takes place about, it's about the Stanford uh, University case with Brock Turner and it's her side of the story. It's just, it's really as, as a, you know, a woman coming into my own in, in my twenties, it, it was just really, I gravitated towards it. I learned a lot and it, it was really able to shape my feelings and my thoughts about around like women in society today and how we um, are, how we are adapting to different things and think different things need to be adapted to us. So. I think that that I highly recommend Know My Name by Chanel Miller. I think okay. it's a really great book. Okay, awesome. And yeah. so what's next for you? What, you know, we've talked a little bit about this, like, what are you doing with this study? Like, it's so fascinating. I'm, I feel like every company should have to have a copy <laughs> on their desk. Yeah, um, um, I'm, I'm connecting with people such as yourself and I'm really, I'm reaching out to different people in HR and just talking about what they're currently doing. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not a whole transformation that needs to be done. It's bits and pieces. It's really like starting in the groundwork and the fundamentals and seeing what, what, what is the best strategy and to try different things. And I'm, I've had talked to different consultants and practitioners about where we are now and what millennials want to see. And they're very fascinated with the data and like the heart, like the concrete evidence. So that's what I've been doing now. Um, and I'm like, I, even those 22% of companies that do nothing, every cult, every company has a mental health culture, whether they invest in it or not, it's there because like, everyone has mental health. Yeah. So it's there. And it's just, I, I think it's really important to foster it as much as you can and to grow it and to make sure it's as healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what I'll be doing. Awesome. And if people are listening to you now and they would like to get in touch with you, how can they best do that? Sure. Um, well, you're, ha you're welcome to reach out to me 
through LinkedIn, mm -hmm. my full name, Johanna Seitenbach. I'm sure it'll be listed below. Yep. Or you can email me at jseitenbach at gmail.com. So either through LinkedIn or email, I check my email quite frequently. So be happy to connect and to share some of my research findings. If anyone is out there who's read my thesis and has questions, I'm happy to answer mm -hmm. that as well. Mm -hmm. um, or do I have a, a slide deck that I can present to different teams if that um, is suitable for anybody listening. So yeah, mm -hmm. flexible, happy to share my findings. Uh, you know, it's such an important topic and I'm, I worked hard on it. So I'm happy to share Perfect. it with anyone yeah. who's willing to As listen. you should. Yeah, yeah it's it's you. really amazing work. Um, I'm super stoked about all of the findings. You know, I think it helps all of us as well as like the external uh, <laughs> providers, you know, to kind of highlight more why it is so important um, mm -hmm. to take care of the mental health programs in your company. And yeah, I'm super excited that our paths have crossed thanks to yes. LinkedIn and the technology today. I know, <laughs> with exactly. The, with the mental health hashtags, which is so <laughs> Yes. and yeah so thank you so much good luck with everything um thank i you. think that that's just the tip of the iceberg that you're touching there and there's so much more interesting research that you can do and i'm sure that a lot of leadership teams are really interested in what you're what you have to say so thank yeah. you thanks thanks so much for having me i'm so glad to be able to share today awesome have a wonderful day johanna thank you <laughs> thanks mm -hmm. bye bye if you enjoyed this episode, I would be extremely happy and grateful if you could leave me a comment and a 5-star rating. If you know someone who would benefit from the information I talked about today, please feel free to share it with them, no matter if it is your friends, your colleagues and or your family members. You will always find all links and a summary of the podcast in the show notes. It would be great if we could connect on Instagram or via email. You can find all details of how to find me in the show notes as well. In that way, you can also send me any questions that you might have. And as I mentioned, I also have a wonderful YouTube channel now where you can post comments and questions. So please reach out. I'm glad you're listening to this podcast. Thank you so much for your trust. With gratitude, Julia.